So, Hunter, what's up, brother? Welcome to the show, man. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for having me on, brother. I'm glad we finally made it happen. I promise I haven't been dodging you. (laughs) (laughs) You've been just as busy as I've been from what I've seen. It looks like y'all just got done with a fun weekend up there. Yeah, you know what, man? I uh, I try to stay busy. Uh, My way of giving back to the sport is trying to uh, connect the community, right, the fitness community, with the high-level aspect. Um, I'm blessed and humbled to have access to individuals like you, right, Um, which allows me to connect that to a community that, for the most part, we never had a chance um you know besides shooting a shooting a dm or going to the olympia which is still like not the same because you're like rushing through a thousand people man um yeah you put out an event where people actually get to sit down and talk with people and you know have a second with them and you know it's a uh it's a testament to the way that you do business that you are you know around and thriving in the day and age of amazon that's very rare for a brick and mortar store to be doing so you know it's very evident that you're doing something right up there i've never been up there you got to get me up there sometime Bro, I'm, I'm, yeah. Listen, you're coming down, then. You're, you're coming down, dude. And we're gonna, we'll make it happen. We're gonna definitely make it happen, man. I'll uh, ride a airdrop pallet of RTDs down. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Listen, man. It's uh, a lot of people uh like ask what I do a little bit different. Like besides, what you don't get to see on a social media is uh the the most rare the rarest thing nowadays is actual truth, right? So when you give people um, actual truth around supplements, uh, health and stuff like that, you become so rare compared to everybody around you, man. But anyway, this is about you. Listen, (laughs) I want to know just like everybody else, right? Because I know your bio, but I want to hear from you, man. Like, you know, listen, you're just like everybody else. You were a kid. Something got you into being a bodybuilder. Now, granted, your dad, right, is uh, famous within the sport. But something got you into loving the sport, being 110% into it, and then moved you into where you are now, man. So give us the bio, man. Talk to us. Absolutely. You know, um, I guess if we're talking about how it came to be bodybuilding-wise, I'm going to go back to, you know, five, five-ish years old and talk to you about my first love, and that was hockey, believe it or not. Um, you know, I feel like I owe just about everything I have – as far as, you know, like the work ethic, the mindset that I have. And granted, you know, I've, I've nurtured and, and developed it within the bodybuilding space. Yeah. But I feel like every last bit of the foundation that I had, you know, to like, you know, do the tough shit to, you know, like to be able to suffer, to be able to do what I do in the gym. I feel like that was a foundation that I started building when I was five, you know, as okay. far as this. And, uh, you know, first things first, I got to say, what is it? Like, this is the question I get asked all the time. What was it like growing up with Lee in the house? Lee was just dad like until i was 15 or 16 years old and really started getting into lifting and you know like thought in my head you know like okay when i get done playing football you know bodybuilding sounds cool you know and i started really looking into that like it started Mm -hmm. like click with me just how you know like monumental and paramount of a career he had and how like groundbreaking it was to do to the size that he was so i will say that but you know like i'll back it up like he was just dad until high school to me so yeah. and that was a really cool dynamic. And he was just dad from the standpoint that, you know, never once pushed bodybuilding on me, never once pushed me into any sport. He allowed me to find what I loved. And then once he found, like, once he saw that commitment, you know, come naturally, like I wanted to do it. Like I wanted to do hockey. I wanted to, you know, I started playing, you know, just the random sign up pickup league and, you know, a year into it, it was like, I want to play on this travel team and, you know, I want to go try out for this. And, you know, he always enabled me and he always, you know, pushed me. And, you know, once I was committed to hockey, he never like rode my ass hard, but, you know, we, you know, I was, I was a forward. So, you know, I was like, it was a bad game if I didn't score a goal. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, was like, I was happy. I was happy if I scored two and, you know, it was a great game if I scored a hat trick, mm-hmm. but, you know, that was the kind of, you know, like pressure that I put on myself, even at, you know, like five, six, seven, eight years old is, you know, I wanted to excel at sports. You know, that was always my thing. I always identified as an athlete. So, you know, yep. we'll continue you know, played hockey all through grade school, played hockey in, uh, you know, middle school, and then seventh grade rolled around. And, you know, up until this point, you know, I was a scrappy little forward. I was like four foot 11 and like 85 pounds dripping wet. You know, in hockey, you don't have to be the biggest guy, especially Correct. a forward. If you, know, you use your body well, you can play. 
football is different, especially here in Texas, yes. man. Football's a religion down here in Texas. So yes. you know, being four foot eleven and eighty five pounds wasn't cutting it. So the scrappiness from hockey carried over though. And I was like one of two people that started on the eighth grade A team in seventh grade. So you know, that was, you know, another one of those, like, if I can look back and, you know, put my finger on like moments, you know, throughout my childhood and formative years, that was like that first time I was like, okay, you know, I, I am a little different, you know, if I continue to put my head down and work, you know, I'll continue to excel. Yeah. And, you know, that's when I truly like bought in and, you know, like, like I said, I was like 85 pounds dripping wet. So it was like, that was the first time I was like, all right, dad, I got to get big. How, how, how are we doing this? So, <laughs> you know, from seventh grade until 12th grade, and granted, I was growing up too. Yeah, but I put yeah. Out Twenty to twenty-five pounds a year from seventh grade all wow. the way to my senior year of high school. And you know, I was going to school with like a grocery, like a, just a plastic bag with two peanut butter jellies, an RTD, a granola bar, a banana, an applesauce, and then like a huge ass Tupperware from what we had from dinner the night. Before. Yeah, bro, and that's that's, that. and you know what? That's for that's so rare because like, like you're, we're going back a little bit. Like that's just rare because fitness wasn't even like. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, and, you know, this is not tooting my own horn. This is just calling it what it is. I was more committed and more on my diet from the time I was like 15 years old on than most people like ever hope to be. You know, I wasn't weighing shit and this and that. But, you know, like like I said, I, I just listed out like everything that was in that bag because I still vividly fucking remember it because I ate it every single day for four years straight. You know, like so I'm, I'm committed from that standpoint that I knew I had to get the food in and I ate it and, you know. So that, you know, in conjunction with the training, I was very blessed. You know, another one of those, like, put my finger on these moments growing up thing. I was very blessed to have an awesome strength and conditioning coach. You know, like one of those guys that wouldn't let you squat with any weight on the bar until you could squat until an empty bar perfectly. Yeah. Like, really and truly knew his shit. Like, should have been coaching and had coached at a Division One school in the past. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to coach his boys, and I played high school football with his boys. So... You know, that was a huge blessing to have him. You know, yeah. he'll never see this, but shout out to Coach Swanson. You're the man. <laughs> yep. So, you know, between that, you know, like making the team in seventh grade and then, you know, truly, I truly excelled all through high school at football. It was really fun. You know, I bought into it like hook, line and sinker. I was the one that, you know, like enjoyed summer practices. You know, like I wanted to be number one at everything. And, you know, I just I developed a very, 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 very competitive edge at a very young age. Yep. So, and, you know. All through middle school and high school, it was always one of those things that, you know, the athletics, while they were the most important thing to me, I didn't get to play sports if I didn't make good grades. And, you know, good grades in my house was A's. You know, oh, I, gotcha. I, I made two I made two B's in high school and I got grounded both times, you <laughs> nice. know, so that was a, it was a very high standard that I was held to. And, you know, it, it, even at the time, it wasn't one that I was like resentful of, you know, because I knew it was going to carry on. Like, granted, I wasn't happy that I get grounded yeah. for you know, weeks at a time, but, but you know, it, it was what it was. Yeah. But it builds so much character, man. People don't realize how much character and how much that translates versus the per to the person's life as they become an adult. Absolutely. And, you know, I'll be the first one to say that I, you know, was extremely fortunate and blessed to be in a position to where as long as I was handling my business at school, my parents were going to support me. And, you know, that was obviously true in middle school and high school, but it was also true once college came around. You know, they supported me through college. They paid for my school. You know, I'm very blessed to be able to say that. I know that's not something that everyone can say. It's not lost on me. I was very fortunate to be able to say it. But, you know, it allowed me to continue to build that focus of, you know, okay, I have to take care of school, mm -hmm. but I'm going to excel at bodybuilding, continue to eat all my food. And, you know, I'm not going to say that it's a rare thing, but I don't think it's a common thing for a bodybuilder to have a four-year degree, you know, let alone an economics Correct. degree from Texas A&M. So, yeah, you know, bro. I am proud of that. I don't say it a lot, but I am proud that I was able to do that while, you know, building the physique that I graduated college at 22 and I competed for the first time at 25. So I was building the physique all through college. Yeah. So, you know. Football ran out for me my senior year. Senior year, uh, I ended up playing six games. The first day of two days, I pulled my hamstring pretty bad. By the time I got back from that, I played five games. And then my sixth game, my senior recognition game, I actually avulsion fractured my hip. Ooh. So my last play of high school football was like a 52-yard run up the middle that should have been a touchdown on any other day. Oh, uh, and it pulled yeah. and, it, and it went. Yeah, like I got that. caught from behind because my hip had basically exploded when I hit the hole. So... Um, I came back from that and I actually had earned a scholarship to a school up in uh, Boston. It was division two school. It was, 
you know, a top 10 place to do a business degree. And at the time, a top 15 ranked football school for football. So, you know, I was like, okay, this is cool. You know, I'm getting the education and I'm able to still play football. Yep. But after that senior year and after being jacked up as much as I was, and, you know, I had gotten to the point where I love training to play football as much as I like playing football. And, you know, that senior year being hurt like that, I didn't want to be out of the gym. So I started training on a bodybuilding split, you know, because I could because I could yep. split my upper half into three days, you know, instead of yep. you know, upper, lower, off, upper, lower, like I'd been. So, you know, training on that split, you know, like watching what happened, it truly, you know, tipped the scales to where it was, OK, I like training to play football more than I like playing football. And then when I got to camp my freshman year and it wasn't, you know, high school football in Texas with my best friends, but it was, you know, division two football up in Boston with a bunch of people that I don't know. And, you know, I'm just calling it how it is. My high school football games were a much bigger deal than these college games. Yes. It was a 50 hour a week time commitment. And, you know, at that time, I already told you how much, you know, like soft tissue stuff I had my senior year. You know, I'd also dislocated my shoulder and broke my arm, which has been the root of everything that Ooh. I've had going on for my bodybuilding career. And then had three concussions too. So, wow. you know, I, I had gotten pretty dinged up, but nothing that was going to last, you know, like past football at that point. But, you know, at that point, I knew I wasn't going to play football on Sundays, but I wanted to continue to be an athlete. Yes. So, you know, I made up my mind that, okay, you know, you could have played football for four years, but at the rate you're going, you may or may not cause an injury that's going to impact bodybuilding. You know, you have a real shot to do bodybuilding at a high level you know, let's fully commit to this and see what we can do. And I made that decision my freshman year of college. It was a very unpopular one with my dad, believe it or not, like to the point where whenever I said I'm coming home from camp, you know, camp starts two weeks before school. He told me find a ride home from the airport. Like he was Ooh, pissed. He was mad, yeah. He was pissed, you know, because at that time, you know, he had watched me for four years, commit myself to it, you know, junior, senior year, summers, was it, you know, five, six, seven different school camps, you know, all summer long, like really hit the hit it hard trying to get recruited for college football. So for me to be like, Dad, I'm gonna be a bodybuilder. Uh, you know, he was just like he was so, bad, yeah. You know, it took a while, but you know, I, I'd say by, you know, the end of the first semester of college where, you know, like I came home, I had great grades, I made great grades, and I put, you know, 30 pounds on in yep. one semester. You know, I went from looking like you know, like a stocky running back to that kid's well, bodybuilder. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrestling. So, you know, between the grades being what they should have been and that kind of progress in the gym, you know, I kind of saw him like soften up to it. And he's like, okay. He's because he probably saw your structure. He saw it. He saw what yeah. was what was yeah, there. No, for sure. For sure. And then, you know, he saw that I was happy. And, you know, like I said at the very beginning of this, you know, he doesn't care what I'm doing. He just wants me to be striving and excelling at whatever mm -hmm. I'm doing. You know, that's always how it's been. So, you know, freshman year of college rolls around and, you know, I full send it in obliv into oblivion with bodybuilding. And, uh, you know, the next four years, I really just keep my head down, work, you know, take care of school. You know, I know I want to compete, but, you know, I've, I've kind of, you know, I've said this enough now where it's kind of a coined phrase of mine is I knew I wanted to compete on an Olympia stage. Right. You know, that was the end goal, even when I was 19 years old and decided I wanted to bodybuild. So... I didn't want to be a good amateur. I didn't want to be a great amateur. You know, I didn't want to like the pro card wasn't the end of the journey. You know, winning a pro show wasn't the end of the journey. So very much so between that mindset that I had and then my dad having been there and done that, we mm -hmm. took a long, long, long road for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's everyone always wants to talk about, you know, like the overnight success and ignore like the 10 years that went into it. Yep. I decided I wanted the bodybuild when I was 19 years old and I competed for the first time at 25. 25, yeah. And, you know, from 19 to 25, it wasn't any of that, you know, like, oh, there were six months here where I fell off. And then, you know, like another six here, where I just wasn't feeling it. And then you know, it was nose to the grindstone from 19 to 25 for it. That's very unique, man, because a lot of times um, we don't we don't see that. We don't see that people would jump into the show, especially. And listen, you're you're I, I assume 100 percent you were making significant progress. And a lot of times people are like, nah, I got to jump on stage, see where I'm at, and then keep going. So mm -hmm. just have that hunger and not being on stage yet. Now, do you think a lot of the hunger was just your dad saying, look, here's the plan. Here's how we have to do it. Or did you ever have like an itch where it's like, I kind of want to go step on stage earlier? You know, no, there was never an itch to step on stage earlier. One thing that I can say about myself is I've always been very you know, pragmatic about things, you know, especially when it comes to bodybuilding, I was able to look at myself and, you know, like I knew the show I wanted to do, you know, like for my first show. So, you know, like every year I'd, you know, I'd go to the show, I'd see it in person, I'd watch the overall and, you know, 
at first it was like, nope, not going to win the overall. Next year comes around, oh, I could probably win my class and maybe get in the mix. You know, third, fourth year runs around. I was like, okay, yeah, I'd definitely be in the mix for the overall. You know, fifth year rolls around. I look better than the dude that just won, and I'm just kind of walking around right now. And at that time, it was like, okay, you know, now now it's now it's time to pull the trigger. Now it's time, and it's yeah. time to do the first one. So, you know, just very much so had had, had the long game for it. When you when you did your, when you did your first show, did you uh, I, I, what was your placement in the early eight times of the career? Because you did the first so, show, and then what? Where did you transition after that? Yeah. So believe it or not, I have never lost a bodybuilding show outside of Olympia. Still, there you go. Yeah, so go. as an amateur, I did five shows, and I won my class in the overall at all of them. And then including nationals, obviously, national champion in 2018. Yeah. And then, you know, did Tampa for my debut, won yeah. it. Yeah, I remember Went to the that. Olympia, debuted at eight. Next year, did Chicago, won it. Went yep. to the Olympia, placed fourth, obviously. Yep. You know, took the full year off, came back this year, and shit the bed. <laughs> Majorly <laughs> shit the bed, man. So... Yeah, but the, the, I guess what I was trying to get at was, yeah, outside of the Olympia, man, we never lost, never lost so far. So now you did five shows before you went to the nationals. Was that strategic or? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, the way we worked it up was, you know, the first show was what in my mind was one of the hardest local shows in Texas. It was the Branch Warren Classic. Yeah, so that's true. We that when I won, you know, my class and the overall at that show. The next show that we wanted to do, you know, the next rung up the ladder in my mind was like a big regional show. So at the time, the Europa Dallas still had, you know, open men's pro bodybuilding 212. You know, the expo was huge. Um, you know, the year that I watched the Europa before I did it, John Jewett won the overall. And, you know, obviously he went on that year to win mm -hmm. USA. So I was like, OK, you know, this is a good, you know, measuring stick next rung up the ladder in terms of an amateur spot. So did the Europa the following year. I won my class in the overall of that and. That was the first year that I had a lot of people in my ear going, dude, you got to go to nationals. Dude, you got to go to USA. Dude, you're going to do well. Yeah. But you, like you can, you, I, I, it drove me fucking insane hearing this because I still remember it. I can't believe how many people were like, dude, you should really go to nationals, USA. I really think you could place top five your first time out. And in my head, I'm like, what the, what the hell kind of attitude is that? <laughs> yeah, the to, top, right. You're I'm trying to win it. Time. You know, I'm I'm not trying I'm trying to win the fucking overall the first time I go to a pro qualifier. So didn't go to anything that year, the following year, and this was the this was the move in my amateur career that, you know, is very uncommon to me. And you don't see a lot of people doing it. And that was definitely due to my dad's influence, but also definitely due to the fact that it was me just really staying committed to that long game. Is I did junior USAs. Okay. And, you know, Junior USA's gives pro cards to every division except men's bodybuilding. Correct. So I went into the show knowing that while it's a national level show, there's no pro card given. So that was, you know, the next rung, in my opinion. And I won my class in the overall at that. That was 2018. And at that point, you know, I was like, okay, we're ready. We're going to go do nationals. And so that year was the year that we uh, went and did nationals in November there in Miami. And I won, you know, the supers and the overall to go pro. Yeah. Wow. That's an awesome run, dude. That that's a that's a very good run, man. Um, now you you came, you mentioned last year's Olympia, but during that whole time, look, what you did in your career was amazing. Um, anybody you know that does Olympia, they fall backwards, whatever it is. Of course, it's it's something that hurts, right, drastically. But Absolutely. as you kept moving forward. Did you ever have any doubts? Was there anything that was that you had to kind of battle behind the scenes um, besides just the regular of I got to keep, you know, getting improving and I'm not ready yet Dude, to get first? Absolutely. So, you know, I wanted to take a chance to really, you know, put this out there. And this is something that I've been saying, you know, more and more, at, you know, appearances and, you know, seminars and stuff that I'll do to people, because I feel like, you know, especially in our industry, a lot of people don't want to ever talk about stuff that's going on with them, you know? Yeah. It is okay to not be okay. And I will be the first one to tell you that I was not okay for a while after that Olympia. Yeah. You know, like just, and you know, that's, it doesn't have to, like I said, everyone has their own Olympia and everyone's going to fall short of winning their Olympia before they win it. No one's ever won the Olympia the first time they've ever done it. Mm -hmm. You know, so whatever your Olympia is, you're not going to win it the first time you go out. You know, that honestly, it could be, you know, expected, you know, it could go into it expecting to not win it or, you know, it could be like me who is expecting to move up places and be absolutely fucking devastated by it. You know, but I say this and, you know, I've talked about it enough to really, you know, just have it boiled down to its essence. And that is, 
you know, there's a big difference between failing and quitting. Right. You know, failing, you you found out a way not to do it. You came away with notes. You figured out what went wrong. You're going to come back and you're going to do it again. You know, quitting is the only time you ever truly fail. And, you know, having that mindset, and I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, okay, well, you know, we're going to do better next time, pick myself off, dust myself off, and, you know, I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> You know, it was weeks, months that it was, you know, okay, put one foot in front of the other. You know, I don't want to get out of bed today, but I'm going to get out of bed. I'm going to go get on the stairs. I am going to sit there and feel like I'm fucking drowning every morning doing vacuums because I need to bring my waist in. You know, I really just kind of took stock of what needed to happen and started making it happen, even though I didn't want to. And, you know, I think that's something like the biggest thing that came from you know, like the early years and, you know, like nurturing, because I, I really love that word when it comes to discipline, because, you know, it's, it's a practice skill. Yeah. You have to nurture your discipline. You don't just randomly wake up one day and you go, okay, I'm going to be the fucking Terminator. Yep. And I'm going to train myself into the dirt every day for two hours and eat six meals a day and take all my health supplements and never miss anything. Yep. You, it doesn't happen. That, that's a, it's a nurtured yep. thing you develop. So, you know, developing that over, over the years, you know, it gives you something to fall back on. I always say the same thing, you know, discipline versus motivation you know, you're not always going to be motivated. And chances are in like points in your life, whenever you need to be getting shit done and you have to be getting shit done, that's the time when your motivation is going to be the lowest. Correct. You know, you need to be able to have that discipline. You need to be able to get shit done and put one foot in front of the other whenever things are tough. Discipline. And, you know, I yeah. Care, I don't care what industry you work in, whether you're a bodybuilder, whether mm -hmm. you're a finance guy, whether you're a small business owner, like it doesn't matter. That mindset will, will continue to push you forward. Discipline will make you do the things you don't want to do or the things that you hate like you love them. Exactly. I love that Mike Tyson quote. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the fucking quote. Yeah, it's, champions make things they hate, do things they hate and make it look like they love it. Mm -hmm. 100%, man. Um, was that the first time you ever felt this way? Um, and now do you think it's possibly because you had such a successful career coming up? Um and it was maybe something that, like, in your mind was like, you know, we're just going to keep moving forward. So was that, like, the first time that ever, like, you ever had this feeling? Or did you ever have any other instances before then? You know, this was the first time after this last Olympia that I truly had, you know, those, you know, take a step back. Like, what, what are we really doing here, man? You know, is this really what you want to be doing? You know, just because... You know, like last year, like last year was a funky year for me, man. You know, I'll talk about how it's okay to not be okay. Last year, I traveled 23 weekends out of the year, Oof. you know, doing guest, guest posings, appearances, seminars, a set to another. And, you know, between that and, you know, the fact that I didn't compete all year long and was just getting ready for one show, you know, I was in a really funky headspace and had a lot of, a lot of pressure on me. It was just, it was just a really funky year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was the first time that I had ever, you know, set a goal, like truly, you know, like set a goal in bodybuilding and just completely falling on my face with it. You know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I can be the first one to say that am I proud of the fact that I've never placed out of the top 10 and that I was number seven in the world last year? Yes, I think I think that's awesome. You know, that's something to hang my hat on. But that being said, you know, in my mind, I took three steps back. And, you know, that was the first time that I ever, you know, for a whole year, I was waking up, thinking about it, going to sleep, thinking about it. It was, you're moving up from fourth. You know, I don't know how far you're moving up from fourth, but you are going to move up from fourth. I believe that with every bone in my body for a year. And, you know, for that not to happen, that was, it was truly, truly a shock. It shook me, yeah. you know, to, to that foundation that we've talked about. And, you know, uh, I'd like to say that because, you know, the foundation's solid and, you know, the discipline's been nurtured that, you know, while it was a huge kick to the dick, I'm not going to lie, you know, I was able to get things back on track and, you know, address, you know, the faults from the Olympia. And I feel like I'm on track to present, you know, something that people have never seen out of me this year. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm truly excited for this year. And that's, a, know, that's the thing I was it, just about I'm not so going to say that I got complacent, but, you know, after placing that fourth and, you know, in my head, you know, like I expected to move up and I've never not met my expectations, you know, not meeting that expectation. I never want to feel that feeling again. Yeah, you know, I was just, I, I was just, everyone. yeah, I was just about to say that the, uh, the placement. So that placement, or Patrick, I'm gonna turn the light on in here real quick. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Like started. You're good. <laughs> uh, 
There right? we go. Now we're good. So, we're good. and it's just the way you said it, man. Like, so a lot of times are, fa- I don't use the word failures, but I just use the word failures, right? Failures or mistakes, right? They are actually a way, they are a secret uh, message going, you, you, this is your way of getting better, right? Because you said, listen, if you were placing and winning on a consistent basis, it's impossible not to get, I'm sorry, if you were winning on a consistent basis and placing super high, it's impossible not to get kind of complacent, complacent with it and feel like we're good. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like the hunger's there, but there's yeah. different levels of hunger. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the best point is, you know, it's like, after I placed fourth, you know, it's like, okay, well, I placed fourth last year doing this. I'm going to continue to do this and I'm going to move up. And, you know, it was great for that logic to get that logic turned yeah. on its fucking head. Because, you know, in order to do something that you've never done, you have to do things that you've never done before. Yeah. You know, that was good enough to get there. I'm trying to go here. It doesn't make any sense, you know, looking at it retrospectively yeah. that I would do what got me here to get me here. That makes no sense. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a blessing in disguise for sure. Ben and I joke, my coach. We call it the same yeah. shot. You got pulled back to shoot forward. That's a good way of yeah, because that's a great way of saying it. Versus that you know, take two, uh, take a step back or take two steps forward. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a that's a good way of uh, of putting it. Now, did because did because of course it's difficult, right? It's always difficult for a coach and an athlete, right? When something happens and they feel like, okay, what went wrong? Was there a difficulty for you? Uh, be- not between you guys, but like. Did he kind of go to that same kind of aspect in turning two where he felt like, all right, man, there, I feel like I failed you the same way um, because I'm sure it hit him, you know, rough too, just like it hit you. No, absolutely. You know, it hit him hard. And, you know, um, I'll be the first one to say, you know, like I told you how, you know, last year all the travel and stuff had me in a weird mindset. You know, Ben up and left his family and moved down to Houston with another one of his athletes, Dean. And we were all basically living and prepping together for the last six weeks before the show. And I remember you know, he's the first one to say it's embarrassing to say, but, you know, he was really having, you know, give me a kick in the ass here and there, you know, until we got a little closer. And so, you know, I don't think either of us were discouraged by it. I think it very much so, you know, because like I said, I, I was doing things, you know, I said, I got forth doing this, so we're going to keep on doing this. And, you know, Ben, you know, he said this and didn't apologize for it, but, you know, owned it. He's like, you know, like I came in and you had been doing all that and I helped you with the last little bit of that. And that got us this. So I didn't want to come in and tell you that we needed to change all this. But, you know, because we experienced that result, you know, it really, you know, put him in the mindset like, no, my name's on you. We're going to do things my way. Mm -hmm. You know, I know what you've done has gotten you here, but, you know, we saw what happened last year. So. I think it was the best thing that could have happened for our, you know, coach athlete relationship, if you will, because one, there was absolutely no finger pointing, like zero, none. Like we were both trying to own it all. And, you know, it was one of those things like there's no fault in what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no mistakes, only lessons. It was the first time that he had owned the whole prep, first time he'd peaked me the entire time. So, you know, we came away with a lot of notes and, you know, we also came away with a result that, you know, caused him to really you know, check me, you know, in the best way possible, you know, I'll say he had to check my ass yeah. and, you know, I respect him for doing it. And, you know, I feel like we're, you know, operating at a whole new level right now because of it. That's pretty good, man. That's pretty good. Now, the last part is what advice from your own perspective, right? Do you have for other people? Because listen, the, the reality situation is not everybody's going to be pro. Not everybody's going to maybe even when they're overall in their local shows right but what advice do you give them um at the end of the day besides the typical stuff that they always hear yeah so this is one that i normally say for when people ask me like i've never competed for what's your advice but you know the more and more i do this and what i experienced last year and the mindset that i've had to dig myself out of you know and i'll be the first one to say like i recently emerged from the tunnel like recently dug myself out of it is at the end of the day, like getting to bodybuild at any level, like whether you're world's shittiest amateur or vying for an Olympia title, if you're doing bodybuilding and truly doing it, it's a privilege. Like It is such a privilege. You know, you are going to the gym once or twice a day. You are eating six times a day. 
you know, you have prioritized your physical health, like something that's going to last and like be good for you. You know, it is such a privilege to get the bodybuilding, you know, competitively bodybuilding. It is a large financial outlay Correct. towards the end of preps. It very much so, you know, robs your relationships. It robs yes. your work productivity. You know, it impacts you. So to be doing that, you know, to make the choice to do it, you know, you have to remember it's a privilege. No one's making you starve. You know, no one's making you do doubles of cardio. And, you know, I feel like that's an easy mindset to get out of when you're in prep because, you know, you're fucking miserable and yeah. you, know, you want to start just lashing out at people around you. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a privilege to get to do it. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to take it so far and extreme. Like, you know, there's people starving all over the world and you're eating six times a day. But, you know, you are actively choosing to manipulate your nutrition to be starving. It's not like you're not yes. getting enough food because you can't eat. Yes. Like, it is actively a decision to do this, you know. So the biggest thing I can say is never lose sight of the fact that it's a privilege. You know, it's a privilege to be able to get up. It's a privilege to take your breath. And, you know, in the bodybuilding sense, it's a privilege to look the way that we do. It's a privilege, you know, have bodies that can do things that, you know, like, I don't know. If I really take a step back and think about some of the shit that I've done in the gym, like, it's cool. You know, it's like not a lot of people can say that they've done it. You know, I lose sight of that and I stop and smell the roses. But, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to do a better job of it. And it's my personal thing that I'm putting a lot of effort into right now. And that is, you know, remembering everything is a privilege, not a right and not something that yeah. I have to do. And, and I like the way you said it, man, because, uh, you know, to touch base on top of that is, you know, for everybody that gets to compete, it is a, it's your, it's your, it's a privilege for you to do it. Um, and motivate others by being positive and, um, encouraging versus, you know, negative or yeah, I'm miserable. I'm this and that, this and that. It's like, cause yeah, we, we choose to do it. And I think a lot of times people forget the you know it's not your family's fault that you're starving right it's not your job's fault that they need you to do extra work and you're tired it's nobody's fault so you choose to be in a miserable state to create a physique that's out of this world do it because they're going to admire it at the end but they're going to admire it a lot more if you didn't treat him like shit getting exactly. that you know what exactly. i mean because if you treat like shit, then you're not going to motivate other people to want to do the same thing. Yeah, let's honestly, let's be completely truthful. Outside of our little like cultish world, no one gives a shit about our glorified beauty pageants that we get up and do in our banana hammocks. Correct. No one cares. It Correct. does not give you the right to be a douchebag to anybody. You're not better than anyone because you do it. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So it, it very much so. Yes. Yeah, privilege. I'm glad. Yeah. Glad we see eye to eye. On yeah. That one. I used to uh, last part. I used to always crack up. Because I know you always read it, right? The people who, yes, they do take it as a, you know, they they lash out or the ones that, you know, want to um, elevate it like it's some kind of battle or war. When in reality, no, you're, you're not, you're, you're, the training part is the easy part. The training part is the fun part. That's your privilege to enjoy yourself, escape the the battle is the, the, the eating all, you know, all day following the diet and so forth. Um, it, but yeah, again, people just people take it to you know extremes. But at the end of the day, look, man, if you look, our our goal is, you know, we have our internal goals, right? Whatever it is in a sport. Um, but at the end of the day, the sport gives a lot to us, right? You know, if the sport wasn't around, it wasn't as big. You wouldn't be able to have a career from it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I wouldn't be able to have this platform. You know, have stores, all these different things. Um, Bodybuilding my... and the fitness industry has given both of our families just about everything they have in one way yes. or another. Sure. Yes. So sure. what I feel like our responsibility, right, is is to give back to the sport, right? Yeah. Um, because if we give back to the sport, we allow it to grow, and then we allow the next generation to flourish even more within being the, being within good sport. stewards of the sport. Yeah. Yeah, guiding it, shaping it the way that we want we want it to be for sure. A hundred percent. But that's it, man. I know you're you're probably right. Are you getting tired from the food that you ate? All that food that you got to refeed? Man, I'm I'm good. I it was post leg, so my body kind of soaked it up pretty good. I'm riding like a I little, figured. little carbohydrate high right now, still about to uh plop on the couch and watch Ice Age with my daughter and wife. So I'll probably start getting sleepy once I plop. <laughs> was that uh was that your last that wasn't your last meal or was it your last meal? No, I got I got two more. Yeah, I oh, got two more. 
Oh yeah, you got tons of food still to go. You're good. You're good. How how old's your daughter? Uh, she's seven. She'll be eight in June twelfth. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. So we just finished up second grade today, actually. So go yeah. to the third. Crazy. Don't be mentioning it. That's awesome. Well, listen. Go watch this TV with her. Um, enjoy your time. Does she have a favorite movie that she always wants to watch nonstop? <sighs> what is it right now? Um, we've been watching a lot of Full House lately. Really? Yeah, she loves. Because she it. relates to the little girl. Yeah, she yeah. loves it. So we've been watching a lot of that, and then um, let's see. As far as movies go, babe, hey, what have we been watching with her lately? Uh, yeah, we watched School of Rock the other night. She loved okay. that. That was a good Jack Black. She likes the Hannah Montana movies. Yep. You know any of the Pixar and Disney stuff lately? Yep. You know, I was one of those people that before I had my daughter, I had seen like every animated movie that had come out up until that point. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney. It's yeah, awesome. Have just gives me more of an excuse to watch them. My uh, my two daughters. So, uh, there's there's two movies, right? So my uh, my oldest daughter. It was um, I'm probably getting the two movies mixed up, but one of them was Finding Nemo. Every yep. single day was Finding Nemo. Every single day, and the other movie was Car- Caroline. That that, was good. that movie is so good. Like it's such a good movie, but those were like it literally every single day. We have to watch this movie, and that's it. No efforts or buts. It's so too funny about when that when they're little man, they just like the familiarity of of stuff. They like knowing what's going to happen because everything's so new to them. So when they can have something that's familiar, they love it. <laughs> yeah, like Brooklyn was like that when she was growing up. She'd go through like two three month phases where he'd watch the same movie every yep. morning. And, yep, because sure. she knew what was coming and she was excited to see it again. But listen, I'm not going to hold you up from your family, dude. God bless. Thank you so much for jumping on, man. And uh, Thank you for having me, Patrick. Of course. And enjoy your time with your daughter, man. Absolutely. Looking forward to getting up there sometime soon. Oh, you will. You will. (laughs)